Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining MTM's webinar on ASEAN's future and its potential for global businesses, hosted by Bauer Group Asia. I'm Unha Claire Kim, Director of Government and Corporate Affairs Team at MCHAM, and I'm very pleased to kick off today's webinar. BGA is a strategic advisory firm that specializes in the Indo-Pacific, offering unmatched expertise and experience to help clients navigate the world's most complex and dynamic markets. Today, we are fortunate to have Ambassador Scott Marcial, Senior Advisor at BGA. Scott is a former senior U.S. diplomat, has more than 35 years of experience in diplomacy and public policy, much of it focused on Southeast Asia. Scott served as a U.S. ambassador to Myanmar from 2016 through 2020, Indonesia from 2010 through 2013, and as a first U.S. ambassador for ASEAN affairs from 2008 through 2010. Following his ambassadorships, he worked as a visiting scholar and practitioner fellow at Stanford University's Walter Schoenstein Asia Pacific Research Center. He will share key insights on the region and how to understand these potential opportunities from a business perspective under the topic of a closer look at ASEAN investment opportunities for Korean corporations and insights into the future potential for the region. As far as webinar structure, we'll begin with the presentation followed by a fireside chat and end with the Q&A time. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So without further delay, I'd like to hand it over to Scott. Well, thanks very much to AmCham for giving me the opportunity to talk about ASEAN or really the region of Southeast Asia. And thanks to everyone for, for joining. Uh, I'll have a little bit of a slide presentation. I'd like to start now. So it's the 55th anniversary of ASEAN, the founding of ASEAN uh, this year. Um, ASEAN was established by the original five member nations, uh, Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, Philippines, and Singapore in 1967, mostly as a grouping to try to manage the issues among the countries of Southeast Asia, and frankly, to keep the big powers from interfering and inter intervening in their affairs. Um, over the years, it's expanded from five to 10 members and has developed a much broader agenda. So now it's pursuing the building of communities, economic community, political security community, and social cultural community, and also really promoting economic integration. Um, the ASEAN is at the center of some of these big uh, international fora that are used to try to address global and regional security and economic issues. You know, the ASEAN Regional Forum, the East Asia Summit, which you probably saw was just held in Cambodia a few weeks ago. Um, so it's, it's become a much bigger player uh, internationally and certainly in the region than it used to be. Um, what's important to understand, we could talk a lot about ASEAN and use ASEAN and Southeast Asia interchangeably, but we have to be a little bit careful with that. ASEAN is an institution. It's a little bit like the EU, but it's a lot different than the EU. It's not a supranational organization. It's really more of a collection of 10 member countries. And so when you're talking about, particularly on the business side of things, ASEAN is not going to be your partner in most cases. It's going to be those individual countries. And those 10 countries are very, very diverse. Um, each one has different histories, different cultures, different languages, uh, different political and economic systems, different levels of development. So we group them together as ASEAN, but it is important to keep in mind the, the significant distinctions among them. Um, what a lot of people, certainly in the United States, don't appreciate is what a big economic player Southeast Asia or ASEAN region has become. Um, over the last 20 years, uh, the region has grown by almost 6% a year on average. That's before COVID, but uh, up to 2019. And uh, the region as a whole has been able to reduce the percentage of the population living in poverty from 47% in 1990, so almost half the population in 1990, to 14% in 2015. In 2020, ASEAN collectively, the 10 member countries collectively, constituted the world's fifth largest economy. And expectations are already that it will soon pass Germany to be the fourth largest economy in the world. So this is a big player if you look at it as a whole. 
and also one of the world's largest exporters. You can see up here the different economic growth rates of, of some of the countries in ASEAN. Um, it's a big uh, receiver of foreign direct investment. Um, the region received $70 billion, over $70 billion of foreign direct investment in 2022, uh, the largest inflow of any emerging economy region. Um, amazingly, there is more U.S. foreign direct investment cumulatively in ASEAN than in China, Korea, and Japan combined. And ASEAN is the U.S.'s fourth largest trading partner. I happen to know it's also a, a, a major trading partner uh, for Korea. Um, but the figures, I think, are pretty impressive, but it is important to keep in mind that they mask a significant disparity. You've got some pretty rich countries, Singapore, and a GDP per capita of $72,000 U.S. dollars compared to 1,200 in Myanmar, but most of the others somewhere in between. So again, important to keep in mind uh, the differences among the countries. Um, in, in my view, this is a region that is likely to become a bigger and bigger player um, politically in terms of uh, security, but particularly economically over the next 10 to 20 years. Um, you've got a lot of momentum, a sustained growth, as I mentioned earlier. You've got young populations, so an opportunity for a, demo a demographic dividend. Um, so um, younger population than most of the rest of Asia, really the, all of the rest of Asia, or the United States. Uh, it's a huge opportunity there. And as I said, a solid record of growth, but, but more than that, a sustained effort to integrate into the world economy. So the ASEAN members collectively and sometimes individually have signed a wide range of free trade agreements. Um, RCEP that you're familiar with, Korea also of course being a member of big regional free trade agreement. Some of the ASEAN countries are in the CPTPP and as I mentioned, any number of bilateral free trade agreements. Um, right now, a big focus is uh, in the region is on attracting investments that are moving out of China. Uh, as you all know, um, even as many foreign countries stay invested in China, they're often looking for places to, um, uh, to spread their investments, so plus one or plus two strategies out of China. Um, and Southeast Asian countries are competing very vigorously for that. Um, I said Vietnam probably being the most aggressive and so far the most successful, but also Thailand, Malaysia, Philippines. Um, Indonesia and, and others. And to connect it with that is a, a pretty strenuous effort to join the global supply chain, to become a bigger part of the global supply chain. And again, that matches with the movements out of China. Uh, you're seeing it again. Uh, I think Apple um, recently announced that more of its iPhones are going to be manufactured in Vietnam. I think Samsung, I understand, also is doing a lot of manufacturing of its phones in Vietnam, but also you're seeing this in Thailand, as I said, in, in Malaysia and other countries. So this is a big push for, for the region. You have, uh, as I said, with a young population, you've got really entrepreneurial spirit, lots of startups. Um, everywhere I've been in Southeast Asia, you just have a flood of startups, many of them doing really well. Some in Indonesia have, have you know, really become unicorns doing extremely well and growing rapidly. Um, and uh, an important point is, although the region, uh, the individual countries have struggled with some political and other challenges, the region as a whole, in terms of interstate conflict, has been really peaceful. This is one of the underappreciated successes of ASEAN, is you, you just haven't seen conflict among the 10 Southeast Asian states since really the end of the Vietnam War. Now. In, in the interest of full transparency, I'll highlight some of the challenges that the region faces. Um, to a large extent, again, it varies from country to country. Um, you, you have rule often by uh, entrenched elites who are not generally very accountable. You have some democratic regression, certainly in places like Thailand, um, and most dramatically in Myanmar with a a coup and subsequent military rule since uh, early 2021. You have, and this is both a challenge and an opportunity, 
Um, in many cases, you have fairly weak physical infrastructure, uh, certainly in places like Indonesia and uh, Cambodia, Laos, um, and even in Thailand to a certain extent, the Philippines, uh, you need a lot of investment in infrastructure. The Asian Development Bank estimates that the region as a whole is going to need 210 billion U.S. dollars of investment in infrastructure every year for the next 10 years. Another challenge is fairly widespread corruption. Again, it varies from country to country, but in many of the countries of Southeast Asia, corruption is a real challenge. Um, in a few of them, you have ethnic and religious tensions, uh, notably in, in places like Myanmar, but also Southern Thailand. Traditionally in the Southern Philippines, although that, that has gotten better in, in recent years. And right now you have a huge crisis in Myanmar, as I mentioned with the coup in February 2021, and uh, a coup that really has been resisted by nearly the entire population. And so what we've seen is what I call a national uprising against the military that has led to widespread conflict, uh, a dramatic economic downturn, and uh, a lot of more than a million people displaced. Uh, it's a pretty ugly situation that affects certainly Myanmar and its neighbors, but it also kind of gives a black eye to ASEAN because Myanmar is a member state, and here you have a member state that's behaving very badly and really refusing to listen to its ASEAN colleagues in terms of trying to find a way out. Um, external challenges, um, Russia-Ukraine conflict. I mean, this is an external challenge for all parts of the world, not just Southeast Asia, but there's been some division within ASEAN on how to respond. Some countries have condemned Russia's invasion. Others, for a variety of reasons, have basically stayed quiet. Uh, but all of them are worried about the impact of the war on food prices, energy prices, as well as food and energy security. So you see particularly Indonesian President uh, Jokowi uh, taking a very active role trying to promote um, a, a an end of the conflict, but also efforts to address the food and energy security issues coming out of it. You have, um, again, like the rest of the world, seeing the global economy weaken rising inflation, rising interest rates, declining demand globally, uh, including in China because of, of uh, the COVID lockdown. Um, the U.S.-China tensions uh, that have increased over the last few years also have affected the regime, I mean, sorry, the region. Not so much directly, but it just makes them very nervous. Um, all of these countries in Southeast Asia uh, for all of them, China's uh, the top trading partner, but the U.S. is a valued partner. And they don't want to see tension. They don't want to get pushed to side with one or the other. So they're constantly going to be advocating for better relations between the U.S. and China, as well as saying, leave us out of your conflict. Um, we, we're going to work with both of you. Uh, so that's a huge issue in Southeast Asia. Given all these challenges, um, you, one might conclude that, that the outlook in the near term for ASEAN is, is not that bright, but the IMF uh, 2023 forecast is still for very good growth uh, in the region. I think they've lowered the growth forecast a little bit, but it's still much stronger than almost any other part of the world. It just highlights the dynamism of the region. Um, again, I've already covered some of this, so I'll go over it briefly, uh, views on Russia and Ukraine. Um, some members critical of Russia, others neutral, including some countries that get that depend on, on Russia for armed supplies. Um, Indonesia, as I mentioned, focused on how it affects them, uh, food and energy wise. Um, and, you know, I highlighted the U.S.-Japan, I'm sorry, the U.S.-China tensions and how the countries feel caught in the middle of that. But for most of Southeast Asia, they're looking not only at the U.S. and China, but for other important partners, Japan, Australia, India, the European Union, and certainly Korea, uh, which they see as a good and trusted and non-threatening friend. A few, uh, few moments on the Biden administration's efforts in uh, Southeast Asia um, and, and what China is doing. And this is just my personal view, but basically Southeast Asians as a whole see 
China as you know a huge neighbor. It's not going anywhere. The largest trading partner, um, but one that shows up regularly, um, is always present. The South China Sea conflict, which uh, or, or dispute, which affects some but not all of the Southeast Asian nations, is uh, an irritant for them. It causes a lot of heartburn, but none of these countries are going to you know break relations with china or avoid having decent relations with china it's just too big too important for them in terms of the us again it's been a long-term partner for most of southeast asia provides a lot of security support uh, there's a lot of respect for what the us has accomplished and um, the us remains the second largest market and the largest source of foreign investment in southeast asia the concerns are you know, can we count on the U.S. to show up regularly? Because the pattern over the last 20 years has been episodic engagement. We show up, we're engaged for a while, and then we stop for a few years and we start again. So I think we're really looking to see, show us, convince us that you're here to stay. Um, also, a lot of concern about what they see as declining U.S. economic influence, particularly the decision by President Trump to pull out of TPP really hurt U.S. influence. And so President Biden is trying to restore that through the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Most of the ASEAN countries have signed up to it. But like everybody else, they're asking, okay, wh what's this actually going to produce? And so there's a big question mark next to that. Again, the expectations uh, in the region, they want to have good relations with China and good relations with the United States. They don't want to be dominated by, by either one. And they, they look to really expand their relations with other countries. Um, again, the Biden team has really expanded effort recently. The president uh, showed up at the East Asia Summit uh, in Cambodia uh, after hosting the ASEAN leaders at the White House earlier this year, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. There's been a, a lot of initiatives announced in successive administrations for the U.S. to play a bigger role in infrastructure, really to offer an alternative to the Belt and Road Initiative. So far, those, those initiatives have largely fallen flat because of lack of money uh, and difficulty of, of coordinating with other partners um, like Japan. But it's something that President Biden is very focused on, very committed to. And at the same time, the U.S. is continuing to expand its relationship with individual countries in the region. Um, again, the question on sustainability in Southeast Asia, people are going to say, great, Biden's showing up, the U.S. is very engaged, is this going to continue after the elections in 2024? Um, and they would prefer that the United States, not when it, when it works with Southeast Asia, their message really is, don't come and talk to us about China. We know all about China. Talk to us about what we can do together, U.S. and Southeast Asia. Some of them have concerns about the new fora led by the United States or started by the United States, like the Quad and AUKUS. Is this meant to go around or displace ASEAN? Um, so the U.S. has had to make a real effort recently to reassure the Southeast Asians that these are meant to supplement rather than replace. Um, to finish up, the, when you look at the region as a whole, the concerns even within the region is, you know, they're aware that ASEAN is divided and ASEAN operates by consensus. So if you don't get all 10 members on board, you can't do much, which is why ASEAN has a well-deserved reputation for being slow moving and pretty cautious. And with the Quad and AUKUS and, and other um, fora out there, even within the region, they're saying, how do we remain relevant as ASEAN? So that's a one outstanding question. But despite that, I think the economic strength of the region and its growth potential is going to make it for the foreseeable future a really indispensable market for most countries and most companies. Uh, again, expected to become the fourth largest economy in the world by 2030 collectively. That's huge. More than 650 million people. It's a very big collective market with a lot of dynamism and is very likely to become a bigger and bigger part of global supply chains. So um, to conclude, um, key levers right now for ASEAN, efforts by Indonesia, Philippines and others to improve their business environment, 
improve connectivity among them, which is both hard and soft infrastructure. So it becomes much more one market. And as part of that, addressing the infrastructure financing needs. To me, that means huge opportunities, both on the connectivity front, but also in consumer markets, you name it, telecom, the digital world, everything. Um, it's really hard to find a market this size with this level of dynamism and growth. Um, uh, Korea, South Korea is seen very positively in the region. Um, it's got the advantage of not being a superpower, and so uh, countries aren't wary of it. Southeast Asians aren't wary of South Korea creating problems, geopolitical problems. There's a lot of respect for what South Korea has achieved for the South Korean private sector and its professionalism, its quality. And, you know, last but not least, Korean culture has really taken over Southeast Asia. It's amazing. Everybody's into Korean culture. And that may seem like a small thing, but I think it really is a huge advantage. It's a huge asset for Korea and Korean companies and com companies operating out of Korea. So let me stop there. Thanks. Um, and now, I'd like to invite in my colleague, uh, Managing Director of Our Group Asia of Korea, uh, BJ Kim, for our little fireside chat. Thanks, Scott. Thank you very much. It was, uh, it was extremely informative uh, presentation indeed. I mean, Koreans, we Koreans, so we spend almost all entire uh, month last month, November, uh, on a, uh, ASEAN, talking about ASEAN all the time, because of all this uh, summit diplomacy that was mm -hmm. taking place. President Yoon, uh, you know, having trip to, to ASEAN and meeting with the ASEAN heads of the states and Biden and Kishida and uh, a little bit of extension, G20 uh, meeting at Bali, right. meeting with Xi Jinping and so on. So ASEAN has been in our minds for a long time, uh, for the past several weeks at least. But I think this is the best uh, presentation or summary of the entire context that we are looking at when we are thinking about ASEAN. And uh, I have kept come up with several questions listening to uh, what you had to say. And uh, the first thing is, uh, you know, when we talk about ASEAN, of course, always the, the number one issue is what is their identity, right? And then you, you touched upon it. ASEAN is not one, it's just the, the big boundary that they use to call these countries. The thing is, so uh, you have talked about their different status, different level of development. Uh, for instance, you mentioned the number of uh, 72,000 US dollar uh, per in capita income for Singapore versus, uh, you know, uh, 1200 mm -hmm. US dollar income for Myanmar. So shows us the gap and the level of development. But going beyond all this level of development and material, uh, you know, well-being and so on, the identity, you know, uh, I, I wonder how would we group them? How are they different? Uh, is there some way we can like uh, group them together or are they all like 10 different countries all going separate way? Uh, can you help us out in terms of understanding the, the identity of uh, the members of ASEAN as individual players, but as a subgroups if possible? Sure. Yeah, it, it's really interesting because again, I've spent probably 20 years in and, and working on on Southeast Asia, and the countries really are very different. Um, ASEAN, you know, because of so many ASEAN meetings, they, they've really developed uh, pretty extensive networks among themselves, uh, certainly in the foreign ministry, but also in a lot of the economic ministries. And so they've built a, a sense of community in that sense, but it hasn't really changed uh, the, the fact that it's a very diverse region mm. um, and, and also in terms of size and you have Indonesia with, you know, 260, 270 million people uh, and you have you know, Brunei with less than a, a million. Um, you have, you know, Catholic majority countries, Philippines, you have Buddhist countries, you have Muslim majority countries, uh, you have democracies, you have authoritarian regimes, you have a couple of, of, of communist countries, you know, Vietnam and Laos. As you mentioned all these factors, I get further confused, right? <laughs> all these, these different factors coming in make them all different. Yeah. Is there some kind of like subgroup identity that we can think about? Um, For example, Malaysia, Indonesia. 
how different are yeah. they or are they kind of like do they belong to one subgroup of yeah. uh, you know yeah i mean culturally and linguistically you can group them a little bit um malaysia and indonesia have a pretty much a common language um and in the sense that you know you can people they can understand each other there's a, some slight differences but um and, and they're both uh, majority muslim countries as well as, as neighbors um, and the Philippines um, is, I would, you know, loosely group, I suppose, uh, culturally with them. Um, and the language is different, but it's sort of related. And culturally, I, again, in very simple terms, I, I find some similarities. Um, Thailand and Lao, um, very similar languages. Mm -hmm. uh, culturally, a lot of similarities mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Brunei, I should probably group in with Malaysia and, and Indonesia. Okay. It is uh, culturally basically Malay, but a separate kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, sort of like ocean side uh, countries, those yeah. Malaysia, Indonesia, and Brunei. Yeah, and you could even throw Singapore in there, but Singapore being majority Chinese is, mm -hmm. is a little bit different mm -hmm. uh, culturally. And then, you know, so we in, in the US and the State Department, we call them the, the maritime countries. Maritime countries. Um, and then the mainland countries or sometimes called the Mekong countries because mm -hmm. of the importance of the Mekong River running through. Then that does bind Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, and Thailand right. to a lesser extent, um, Myanmar. But culturally, mm -hmm. with the exception of, of Thailand and Laos, they're quite different. Mm -hmm. uh, Thailand, Myanmar, Vietnam, mm -hmm. um, and Cambodia, mm -hmm. um, all quite different from one another linguistically, mm -hmm. uh, culturally. Mm -hmm. um, they again they share this Mekong River, which right. is which right. is very important. Um, okay. So they've, you know, and again styles of government, mm -hmm. types of government, um, the levels of development. It's it's all quite different. Okay, great, great. Uh, another thing is, of course, when we talk about ASEAN these days, uh, whether ASEAN people like it or not. Uh, you know, a lot of people outside of the region talk about ASEAN a group of these countries as an uh, alternative to China. I know this could be hugely controversial. A lot of people say, make an argument against it big time. But, but whether we like it or not, that is the reality. And uh, that's the way how many Korean businesses see it. And of course, the American business stationed in, in Korea also see it as mm -hmm. well. So when we talk about ASEAN as a group, uh, economies as a next like China or post China alternative. You have mentioned their potentials and, and caveats altogether. And among the caveats you mentioned is the political system, democratic situation, the situation with the democracy, the way they are being ruled, some of the countries. And then the weak infrastructure, corruption and and the ethnic and political tensions and so on. I wonder if you can further elaborate on that because we do understand in general this is a hot place this is where all businesses have to look into mm -hmm. uh, as they think about next decades and then the decades to come uh, please labor elaborate on, on on those points a little bit further for instance the inst uh, instability related to the way these some of these countries are ruled and so on uh, you know thailand situation uh, what are we looking at? Uh, is this pretty much the fixed trouble or is this something that we should think about change over time? Uh, what, what can you tell us about the caveats for the potentials for the ASEAN economies? Yeah, sure. Again, I think a lot of the countries of Southeast Asia would say we, don't, we wouldn't be instead of China, but in addition to, of course. to China. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and you know, the way I look at it, everywhere I've I've lived and, and worked, including in Southeast Asia, but outside of Southeast Asia, there's always a long list of problems for every country. So, you know, Southeast Asia is hardly unique in, in that sense. Um, it, Myanmar is a, in a special case right now because it's in deep crisis mm -hmm. um, with a military junta that's absolutely hated by the population. Mm -hmm. And so that is, you know, um, a political and humanitarian disaster, but also just a horrible economic environment right now. So I set that aside as, as a, maybe a, a unique case. But the rest of the region has been uh, pretty stable. Um, you, you had, you know, some political turmoil here and there, but again, nothing dramatic uh, compared to the rest of the world. Um, Thailand, you have seen um, steps backward from 
uh, democracy to you know two military coups and then a kind of quote elected government that really uh, installed the was kind of fixed to install the the former coup leader as mm -hmm. prime minister. Mm -hmm. But even there, you 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 get a lot of dynamism, and it's all operating in a in a pretty peaceful and stable okay. setting. Okay. Um, so things are not really going out of hand in these no, countries. No, like, not at all. I mean, there's so a huge, you know, huge uh, foreign, including U.S. business presence in Thailand, and mm -hmm. it, I think people there feel quite comfortable. What about the Philippines and Indonesia, for instance? I mean, you know, Indonesia very, very important market economically, mm -hmm. business-wise. And do we help her certain kind of political changes recently, yeah. the actions and so on? Is this another stable economy? And the Philippines, we, we can never figure out what's happening with the Philippines. Like, there are all these things we're hearing, but let's, can you tell us a little bit about these? Two? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I started my, my career in the Philippines and spent a few years in Indonesia. Um, uh, overall, I think both of these countries count as successes. Um, you know, Indonesia, um, was in deep crisis mm -hmm. 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Asian financial crisis right. triggered the fall of President Suharto, who had been, you know, basically the dictator for mm -hmm. um, for a few decades. During which, by the way, Indonesia grew very rapidly. Right. And for a while, you had just utter turmoil, and, and people worried that the country was going to fall apart, but it didn't. Mm -hmm. And it it solidified and uh, became, I think, a consolidated democracy. Uh, around 2004, five, six, um, with strong civil society, uh, mm -hmm. a quite unified country with mm -hmm. good growth, a huge mm -hmm. market, um, and it's still uh, a democracy. Mm -hmm. um, now, just recently, just this week, there's been a lot of news about Indonesia yeah. because it passed this, the parliament passed this criminal code, right. which among other things, outlaws extramarital sex, uh, sex mm -hmm. um, and, you know, threatens to uh, imprison people for up to a year for it. Right. Um, and also uh, prohibits insulting um, mm -hmm. the president. I mean, this is all about domestic politics. But it sounds like a potential risk and trouble for well, international business. How yeah, serious is I mean, I, I mean, we'll have to see. Mm -hmm. I think this is mostly for political show. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, I don't think Indonesia is going to start rounding up people uh, for extramarital sex. <laughs> um, but it's 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 definitely a move in the wrong direction. But I would put it in the context of a country that overall has been has made a very successful democratic transition. Mm -hmm. And now, now that I've left government, I'm allowed to say things like this: politicians. Mm -hmm. Are politicians, right. Right. and this law was passed for political reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying therefore ignore it. Mm -hmm. It's certainly something to keep an eye on. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't go into uh, force for three years, okay. um, so we'll, we'll have time to see. Mm -hmm. But again, I, I would again still group Indonesia in the overall success nice. category. Mm -hmm. The Philippines, mm -hmm. uh, the Philippines is you know is is. Um, also a democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been a democracy uh, really since I was there in 1986, and mm -hmm. uh, former President Ferdinand Marcos was overthrown. Uh, it's it's a it's a messy democracy. Uh -huh. um, there's you know corruption. There's the, each each leader kind of takes the country yeah. in a somewhat different direction, mm -hmm. uh, and so on. But it has been democratic. It's it for a long time. It was underperforming economically, right. uh, with a lot of protectionism and, and corruption and, and these sorts of things. Right. But over the last ten years, it's improved its economic performance. Mm -hmm. um, you had the, the the period of President Duterte's rule. Uh, you know, he was a very um, lively <laughs> and you know liked to say outrageous things. I mean, just um, hearing those words, we thought the Philippines was just going off the track altogether. Yeah, well, was not. Huh? He, you know, Mario Duterte was like a lot of these sort of. He was elected, by the mm -hmm. way. He, he, he's not a dictator. Mm -hmm. He was elected, um, fairly elected, and remained very popular through most of his term. But you know, he had some really controversial policies, particularly yeah. you know this anti-drug movement where they basically the police were killing mm -hmm. people associated alleged to be associated with drugs, right. um, and it was pretty ugly. He he had some pretty tough things to say for the United States. Mm -hmm. um, 
And but I, to me, he was one of this sort of generation we've seen around the world of, of autocrats or would be strongman autocrats. Again, okay, domestic um, politics. Domestic politics. <laughs> uh, I'm not excusing some of the things they did, but it was just the reality. Okay. Um, now you have the election. I think surprising for a lot of people of Bong Bong Marcos, the yeah. son of the former dictator. Right. Um, and uh, we'll have to see. I think initial um, initially. He's making some good moves. He's appointed a lot of technocrats into the key economic positions. He's been very reasonable in terms of foreign policy mm -hmm. and so on. Um, so, you know, people can be skeptical or not because of his background and his father. But I think, um, with the Philippines, it's always going to be a little bit bumpy mm -hmm. and a little bit uneven, a little bit interesting. Mm -hmm. That's kind of Philippines. <laughs> um, but I think it's important to look past the personality of whoever the president is to look at what's going on in the overall mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. And I think you see a lot of opportunities nice. there. Those are really extremely, uh, you know, helpful insights because we're just sitting here he hearing the headlines. You know, sometimes we have this image of some of the countries is going off the track. Where are they going and stuff? But it makes perfect sense. Your words. Now, uh, let's switch our focus to China a little bit. You have mentioned in your presentation that uh, the South, uh, South China Sea issue, it's a, it's an irritant, it's a trade-off. Uh, interesting labeling, irritant but trade-off. But we, we do wonder what really is going on and what do you mean by irritant but trade-off? Because when we see the map of South China Sea, the areas that China is claiming, mm -hmm. It's outrageous yeah. from the third-party perspective, and but you're saying, well, it's a really irritant, but they take it as a trade-off. So we need your explanation yeah. on that, um, because yeah. people like Koreans, you know, very emotional, you know, the, 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 the easily mobilized folks, when they see that happening in our waters, uh, we won't be sitting there. So we need yeah. some explanation. Well, and a lot of Southeast Asians are outraged by it too. Mm -hmm. So when I, I I use the term irritant, you can you quibble over the word, but um, it. It's upsetting, uh, particularly to Vietnam. I mean, the, the, not all of ASEAN members are affected by this. It's Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia, Brunei. Indonesia um, Indonesia's not a claimant, but Vietnamese vessels, uh, Chinese vessels, excuse me, have, have kind of gone into their territorial waters. Um, the Chinese claim is outrageous. It has no basis in international law, and that's not just my opinion. That was the ruling of the international court in, right. in 2015. Yes. That there's no basis for their claims over all the sea. Mm -hmm. They may have a basis for claims over a few rocks mm -hmm. here and there, mm -hmm. but those are just rocks. Right, right. Um, and so the claim is outrageous. For, the, for Southeast Asia, though, on the one hand, they're pushing back the, the Southeast Asian claimants are pushing back any way they can, mm -hmm. uh, both verbally, but also, you know, building up their maritime capacity so they at least can be aware mm -hmm. of what's out there so they don't just see the waters to China. So what would happen is you'd have an area that was right off, uh, was clearly in Philippine waters. Right. Um, or in areas where the Philippines is always administered, or Vietnam, and the mm -hmm. Chinese vessels would just show up and say, this is ours. <laughs> and the others didn't have the capacity to mm -hmm. maintain a presence there. Mm -hmm. So nobody wants to go get into conflict with China. Mm -hmm. But what they're trying to do, and the United States and others are helping them, is build up their capacity to maintain a presence in their own waters. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. frustrated and angry as they all are, mm -hmm. you know, they also face things, what, what are our options? We can't go to war with China. Domestically, we can't concede what's our sovereign, what we think is our sovereign territory. Mm -hmm. um, and China is a really huge and important trading partner. Mm -hmm. And if we irritate it too much, the Chinese will find ways to make us pay for it. Uh -huh. You know, cutting off imports or mm -hmm. cutting off tourism or what have you. So mm -hmm. it's a very tricky issue mm -hmm. um, for these for these countries. And ASEAN is again divided mm -hmm. because the country is not affected by this for the most part. Like, mm, not our problem, mm. uh, right? I'm exaggerating to make the point. Mm. Um, and some like Cambodia, that's traditionally been quite close to China, mm -hmm. end up defending uh, China to some extent mm. on this. So ASEAN as a whole has struggled to put together a conflict. So basically, you're saying is, uh, what you're saying is they're kind of trying to play it down and leave it open, right? It's not like, okay, we'll concede to, the, to China and then we'll, we'll recognize. That's not it. They, they, they want to keep it open. 
kind of like being disputed, but they want to play down a little bit because they don't want, don't want to go direct confrontation. I, yeah, I mean, it, it varies sometimes by day to day. So uh, you'll see leaders in the Philippines or Vietnam or others speaking out pretty strongly on mm -hmm. it and, and trying to, as I said, uh, bolster their capacity to be aware of what's happening in their in their waters or mm -hmm. the waters around the country. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but at the same time, they also um, and they, I think they welcome generally the U.S. pushing back against China's claims, mm -hmm. um, but it's a delicate dance for them. So they have to be very careful about how they do that. I see. Then now uh, let's switch our focus briefly to the United States here, and uh, this duality or uh, gap between two perspectives. One perspective is the you know we have friends in Washington, Amchan members, and, and we like to believe that well ASEAN is basically with us, with the United States, and so on. But you're saying when you when you go there, when you talk to these ASEAN members, ASEAN say, well, United States, China, both important for both of us, uh, keeping them on balance. And we talk about balancing here all the time in this part of the world in sure. Asia and altogether. So. Uh, how, can you elaborate on this view a little bit further because to our American friends and so on, uh, what do you mean by China, United States and kind of equal to superpower in the region, how important they are and all that? Because when we're talk, talking about Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand as the original ASEAN 5, they all sound like pretty close friends with the United States and so on. but. But you're saying not necessarily China is important. Are you saying almost that China is as important as the United States in their region? I'm sure it will, it will differ depending on whom you ask, but, but tell us a little bit about this more of the China. Sure. We want equal terms. Yeah. And again, it, it varies from mm -hmm. place to place um, and over time. Um, but overall, um, I, my sense is that uh, in Southeast Asia, there's um, still um, the United States remains viewed generally viewed quite favorably overall yeah, right. by American people. Mm -hmm. There are certainly some exceptions to that. Mm -hmm. um, and China, I think, might be viewed with a little bit more wariness, um, partly because it's right there, right. it's so close. Right. But it would be a mistake to say that Southeast Asia, I mean, some Southeast Asians are wary of the United States. Hmm. I mean, you guys have a past of where you've, you know, you've intervened in other countries. Several so decades ago. Yeah, yeah, but it's yeah. still fresh in some minds. Mm -hmm. um, and also, but I think overall the attitude is, look, whether we like China or not, mm -hmm. it's right here, it's in our neighborhood, mm -hmm. it's very active. Mm -hmm. It's a huge trading partner, our biggest trading partner. Mm -hmm. It's offering investment through BRI and so on. Mm -hmm. We have to have a reasonably good relationship with China. Mm -hmm. I think all of the countries in Southeast Asia mm -hmm. feel that way. Mm -hmm. But they don't feel like this is a zero, it's not a zero sum game for mm -hmm. them. Like if we have a good relationship with China, we can't have a good relationship with the United States. They prefer, I think, for the most part, also to have a good relationship with the United States, mm -hmm. as well as Japan, Korea, Australia, and the mm -hmm. others. They don't, in other words, they're not trying to choose, or they want to avoid choosing. And frankly, they're right. Um, so the concern of the United States is, again, as I said, are you going to, are you going to be engaged right. over time? Right. Are you going to up your economic game? Mm -hmm. We are a big economic partner, but right. like relatively over time, mm -hmm. our economic importance might be declining a little bit. You know, you, you mentioned United States investment in the region is bigger than U.S. investment in China, Japan, yeah. Korea. That's a really shocking yeah. number you're talking about. So the economic presence seems to be already big. And then uh, we have Indo-Pacific economic framework and all this commitment of the United States, maybe you call it Biden government commitment, maybe Democratic government commitment and so mm -hmm. on. But you're saying despite all this recent uptick of the U.S. commitment, you're saying for a longer period of time, there has been some doubts and uncertainties yeah. about the U.S. long-term commitment to the region. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so you are you saying Washington and the United States has still more work to do to make these people really convinced that the United States is part of this 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh. Um, yeah, if you look back at, at, at the history, I mean, after after the Vietnam War, particularly after the Cold War, mm -hmm. um, the U.S. was engaged, but again, intermittently. Um, in the 2000s, during the George W. Bush administration, mm -hmm. there was not significant engagement right. uh, with Southeast Asia. I mean, there was engagement, but the focus was mm -hmm. um, really the Middle East, the global war on terror, okay. uh, these sorts of things. Right. Um, and then the Obama administration came in with its pivot or rebounds to Asia, where there was sustained engagement and a lot of activity mm -hmm. over three or four years. Then the Trump administration came in and reduced that engagement, uh, uh, um, pulled out of TPP. Mm -hmm. Then the Biden administration has come in and, and tried to you know rebuild it. So it's 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 a matter of um, over time mm -hmm. remaining engaged, not. Mm -hmm disengaging for three or four years at a time mm -hmm. and then engaging again. So mm -hmm. sustained engagement, including at the presidential level. Mm -hmm. it, it's it, We are an important economic player, but it's it's very important, uh, particularly with RCEP and us pulling out of TPP, right. to do something on the trade side mm -hmm. uh, to show that, that we intend to stay a key trading partner. We are a huge market for Southeast Asia, almost as big as China. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the investment is significant, but it's been, it's been, the growth has been slower mm -hmm. in the United States. So that's really important. And <clears throat> I think also important is when we engage with Southeast Asia, there's a tendency, mm -hmm. and now I, now I feel like I'm lecturing my former colleagues in government. <laughs> <laughs> There's a tendency or a temptation of, of senior U.S. officials to go to Southeast Asia and, and warn them about China. We don't need of to course. do that. Mm -hmm. We don't need to do that. Mm -hmm. They know China better than we do. They're fully aware of China, the good things about China and the things maybe that they don't like so much about China. Um, what they want from us is what are we going to do together? China's going to be here. So America, what do you bring into the table? Can we work together on health? Mm -hmm. climate change, trade, uh, security, um, all of these things. And, and we are working with them mm -hmm. on, on these things. They want more. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of going there with a positive agenda that's about them mm -hmm. rather than going and saying, let's talk about China. Mm -hmm. the, this is a really important issue because our audience here and you know, American business and Korean business all together thinking about U.S. commitment to the region because it's a huge factor in thinking about doing more things in that part of the region here. So would you say despite uh, Trump and perhaps because of Trump, would you say there has been a learning effect uh, on the side of Washington? And would you say the commitment to the region will be much more stronger over time, even, even if a Republican government comes in next round? Uh, do you see any possibility of going back to Trump style of uh, America first policy with regard to this region, you know, like, oh, Southeast Asia, maybe it's not as important as we thought before. Maybe we'll do something else. To, well, what do you see in terms yeah, of- Yeah, it's, it's hard to predict. I, I think um, there is um, a bipartisan consensus, I think, in Washington on the need to stay engaged in the region because of China. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's, the right reason necessarily we should be engaged because, the because China, there's a lot of a lot of opportunities mm -hmm. in business and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the ch the fear of China, if you will, is mm -hmm. is it plays a useful role tactically right. in encouraging both Republicans and Democrats to realize we need to be engaged. Um, I, I you know who knows what's going to happen in the 2024 presidential election. Mm -hmm. I think if if you if you have Donald Trump elected again, uh, all bets are off. If it's someone on the Republican side who's not Donald Trump, mm -hmm. I think there's a much better chance that mm -hmm. the policies would be more consistent with what we're seeing right now mm -hmm. uh, towards Southeast Asia and so, toward Asia as a whole. Right, depending on who takes the White House, yeah, different personalities even within the Republican Party, there yeah, will be I mean, some variations. I, yeah, it's again, it's hard to predict, but I, I do think Donald Trump was a bit unique, and I'm not sure that his um, sort of his approach to foreign policy is going to be replicated. Mm -hmm. uh, at least I hope not. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, now, uh, one issue, uh, Myanmar, you, you called it black eye for ASEAN. Um, I know you're not fortune teller and you don't, you're not in that business. 
but overall, uh, you know, people do wonder what's going to happen. And then in terms of what we see inside the country, the movement still seems to be going on. And uh, we hear words from our, from, uh, our friends in and from Myanmar and so on. Uh, can you try to pretend to be a uh, fortune teller and look into the future, in the long term future of uh, Myanmar? Is there any possible words you want to share? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's very difficult to predict what's going to happen there. As I said, what you have is, it's not a sort of coup or a civil war where you have, you know, one faction of the population that favors this and another favors that. It's really a military as an institution mm -hmm. that is hated. It's one of the most brutal militaries anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, that took over, uh, you know, after after perfectly good elections, yeah. um, just took over because it wanted power, mm -hmm. and almost the entire country united. A country that's quite fractious ethnically yeah. and otherwise, right. very united in getting the military out of power. Mm -hmm. um, so they have the the opposition has to both find a way to get the military out of power, but also build trust among the various elements within that resistance mm -hmm. that have long. Uh, been been uh, fractious. Mm -hmm. um, I think the most likely outcome over the uh, likely scenario over the mm -hmm. next year, sadly, is more of the same: uh -huh. declining economy, uh -huh. lots of violence, displaced people. Mm -hmm. The military junta may try to hold elections mm -hmm. to legitimize themselves. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely zero prospect that if they run the elections, that a they would be legitimate in any way, mm -hmm. or b that they would solve the problem. Because mm -hmm. people are, Myanmar people, it, it, you can't exaggerate how much they hate the military. I mean, this uh, is the worst uh, regime in Southeast Asia since the Khmer Rouge. Mm -hmm. And you can't just go in and charm these guys into making concessions. Mm -hmm. I've dealt with these generals. They mm -hmm. are, they're awful. Uh, and um, they don't care how many people they kill. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a, I have a lot of hope for the country long term mm -hmm. because it's a really resilient and incredibly courageous mm -hmm. uh, population. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's going to be, it's going to be tough. Lingering on. As a fortune teller, you're not very optimistic. Okay. Not, not in the short term. Okay. Not in the okay. short term. Okay. I guess, uh, you know, I'm just watching club and, and, and you know, of course you're watching the club as well as the owner of this program here. but. Uh, perhaps, uh, you know, we're getting to, uh, to the end of the program here. Uh, one of the last questions I have in mind, uh, one of the minor, perhaps technical questions, but you mentioned the concerns over ASEAN members' concerns over AUKUS and QUAD, uh, kind of like these new rising uh, formations may possibly replace them and all that. Uh, tell us a little bit more. This audience in, in business, we don't understand the national security affairs as much. Yeah. So what do you mean by AUKUS and QUAD causing concerns in the minds yeah. of ASEAN members? Well, the ASEAN focuses on you know ASEAN centrality, mm -hmm. meaning that ASEAN kind of is, is convenes all the all the major regional and international players at the East Asia Summit and, right. and the ASEAN Regional Forum and these sorts of things where ASEAN chairs and mm -hmm. sets the agenda and that's really important to them and they can do that because they're non-threatening. Mm -hmm. Everyone can go, you know, everyone can agree to go to an ASEAN meeting whereas if the United States or China hosted it, some would be uh, mm -hmm. suspicious or wary. Mm -hmm. Um, but they also want to be the leaders in solving problems in the region. So they look to a certain extent at the Quad, mm -hmm. the US, Japan, Australia, India, mm -hmm. and AUKUS, the US, uh, UK, and, mm -hmm. and Australia, sort of, are you trying to create another mechanism to, to address these issues that Aussie oh, yeah. should be? Um, and they also don't like, they don't want anything that's seen as anti-Chinese. I see. Not because necessarily they love China, mm -hmm. but because to them that raises tensions. Mm -hmm. So they would rather have an inclusive fora mm -hmm. that in, you know, including China. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just a different way of looking at things. I think those concerns have eased. I think there's been some good diplomacy mm -hmm. by the Quad and AUKUS members to explain what it is and what it isn't, and mm -hmm. to re uh, reassure Southeast Asia that they still support ASEAN centrality, mm -hmm. and they're looking for practical things they can do, like deliver vaccines for COVID, right. deal with climate change. So the more that they're able to do practical things, substantive things like that, mm -hmm. I think those, those concerns will ease. 
Uh, final final question because uh, you, you said AUKUS Quad raising possible perception of anti-Chinese stuff. They don't like it. But uh, when we talk about Indo-Pacific economic framework that Biden proposed, what? How many members? Like five, seven members of ASEAN yeah, so joined. Mm -hmm. Uh, then how do we reconcile between these two different ideas, uh, ASEAN against anything that's against China, but in the Pacific economic framework, they, they jumped in. Yeah. How do we explain uh, maybe uh, Biden's success perhaps? I think, it's a, creating this? I think it's a good question. I think, um, I mean, many of you know, the ASEAN members are members of RCEP, which excludes the United States. So I think mm -hmm. when it comes to trade agreements or economic agreements, um, I think they can accept more easily, uh, uh, and, you know, agreements or treaties or whatever it turns out to be that don't include everybody mm -hmm. uh, because it's not explicitly anti-China. And I think most of them wonder what IPEF will really produce, mm -hmm. but they want to be there in case uh -huh. it does produce, mm -hmm. right? It's an opportunity. I mean, the U.S. is a hugely important economy to them, but also Japan, Korea, other countries that are members. So I don't think any of them want to be left, you know, miss the train if this mm. thing starts moving. Through. Sort of like hedging and diversification of yeah, your portfolio. That's, that's, I mean, that's really what all of the ASEANs want to do to varying degrees. They want to have good political security and economic relations with all of the countries. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The more they have that diversification, mm -hmm. uh, the more freedom of maneuver they have mm -hmm. and the more prosperous they'll be. Mm -hmm. Last, last, last question. Since you mentioned economic and business, they're talking a lot, a lot of talks about the, the security cooperation in the region now with greater U.S. presence here and bringing in uh, ASEAN members for joint exercise and so on. How solid is it? Is it all words? And do we actually see some actually solid progress being made seeing yeah. the uptick of this cooperation? Uh, definitely. I mean, you look at the Philippines where the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement from, I think, 2014 is actually really moving ahead. And that means not U.S. bases, but U.S. doing work on Philippine bases and having some access to them with Filipinos. Mm -hmm. So it's not an intrusion on their sovereignty in any way because it's they're still Philippine bases. Mm -hmm. And that's moving ahead mm -hmm. uh, pretty rapidly. You see uh, Japan playing a bigger role there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, U.S. and Indonesia doing uh, uh, Gruta Shield, which is now a multilateral mm -hmm. exercise mm -hmm. and so on. It doesn't mean Indonesia is aligning with the U.S. Uh -huh. It just means they see value in the security cooperation mm -hmm. uh, with the United States. States. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I do think there's a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, I have been educated a lot this morning. I learned so much uh, about ASEAN and so on. So from this wonderful uh, master of ASEAN issues of all uh, uh, divergence. So uh, dimension, I suppose. So uh, I guess floor is back to you. And uh, time I, mean, I think we have time for a couple of questions. Do we have questions? Oh. Uh, VJ from Match Group. Can I read the question out loud? Is that okay? Or can everyone see it? Is this a question actually? <laughs> this is on the new criminal code in Indonesia. Um, yeah, it's a, you know concerns about intensification of religious colors like the Islamic State of the Middle East. Um, a couple of things. One, I think Indonesia is very far away from anything like ISIS. Uh, I mean, I lived there for three years. It's, um, it's you know, a large majority of the population is uh, Muslim. I don't think any of us should find that threatening in any way. It's a very open, tolerant society. Uh, there are some hardliners, but we've got hardliners in the United States and, and other places too. Um, that said, I think, as I said earlier, this law is uh, unfortunate. I think it's a step backwards and um, it won't take effect for three years. So we'll have time and I think it's going to create a, a backlash um, among Indonesians and others in concern about tourism and business and everything else. So I, I said, let's, let's kind of see how this plays out. Okay, I think that was our one question. So, and our time's up. So thanks, thanks so much for, uh, to you BJ and to Amcham.